direction for Professor Sassan and then we will have the lecture and obviously we will have some reception um, kindly provided by the Moroccan Embassy uh, on the third floor. So, uh, please. Imagine a country where you could travel in time. Rooted in Africa, but only nine miles away from Europe. A country where you would find a 3,000 year old city. Holding one of the largest high-end international ports in the Mediterranean Sea. And the largest car manufacturing plant in Africa. A place where you could see the sunrise in Gibraltar. And still make it for breakfast 200 miles south thanks to the very first high-speed train line on the continent. You would then be in Casablanca at Ritz Cafe, discussing 3D printing with leading aerospace manufacturers. Imagine a country where past and future are intertwined. One of the oldest monarchies being an emerging country. A kingdom of stability with a vibrant cultural diversity. A mix of African, Oriental and European influences, with Berber, Arab, and Jewish heritage. A country where close to 17th century ruins. You would find the largest industrial zone for phosphate processing. A country where you could perfect your swing in the nicest place on earth to spend an afternoon, according to Churchill. Or try snowboarding in the highest ski resort in Africa before embarking on a journey into the Sahara. On your way south, you would reach the African Hollywood, where, next to the set of Lawrence of Arabia, you would find the world's largest solar power plant, and wind farms as far as your eyes can see. A country where young men and women embrace their future with hope, knowing they're part of something bigger, and of somewhere beyond. Building a common future from the most competitive and highest planet. Seeing is believing. Welcome to Morocco. Well, it is really an amazing country, so I strongly recommend you to visit it if you haven't already. Um,
what you have seen. I'm not going to bother you with figures, although I would quote a few of them, but I will try to approach the perception of Morocco, of my country, uh, in a way to try to show to you how delicate it is to be, at the same time, a country of tradition, of culture, proud, of his heritage, which goes over 2,000 years, but at the same time trying to be a modern country. It's not so easy. It's the challenge of Morocco. It's every day's challenge. And I travel to Morocco twice a month, and I realize that every month something has changed. Maybe our perception, as an old man and also as a scientist, I consider sometimes that we don't go fast enough. I'm impatient. But when we know the, precisely the balance, the equilibrium we have to have, and I will explain how, it's understandable. But I have the privilege, due to my age, to observe my country for almost 60 years. And I have seen many, many changes from my adulthood to today. And many more things will happen, obviously. As we are in a world of change, a world uncertain, sometimes dangerous, it's not easy to be at the helm of a country and to navigate in difficult waters and nevertheless to reach the heart. Uh, I should start by first of all telling you why the name Morocco on the move. I am organizing, I have been organizing for the last eight or yes, eight or nine years, uh, some kind of similar events like tonight. We generally take one afternoon or late uh, uh, later part of the day, and we bring two or three lectures from Morocco and with local people, because we have, of course, experience outside, we try to have a discussion, a debate on selected topics, not everything, because you cannot in one night or one afternoon to talk about everything. And these uh, topics are chosen by the people who are receiving us, not by us. They choose. And we organize ourselves so that we can meet their expectations and have these discussions running. And we, we talk this Morocco on the move because we are not talking of the history of Morocco. I'm not a historian. I'm a biologist. And therefore, uh, we think that there is a room for history, for nostalgia, for music, for entertainment, and there is a room for, of course, uh, reflection and understanding. Well, therefore, we are talking of a country which has about 1 million square kilometers, a population of 37, 36 million people. Uh, in the northwest of northern Africa, it is really, as we say in Arabic, Maghreb al-Aqsa, because it's the fastest one. And it is 20 uh, or 12 kilometers from Spain, so we are very close to Europe. Our late king, Hassan II, used to say, I can be a member of Europe. If Turkey is trying to be a member, why not me? <laughs> uh, and uh, after all, he was to some extent uh, right. The fact that we are not member of the European community, we are nevertheless uh, in a stage that we call advanced status. And we participate in programs, we can uh, send our students in the uh, Erasmus program, we can have um, several kinds of help and assistance, but we have also to be very rigorous regarding the standards because we are almost equal to Norway and Switzerland. 
So how can we be closer to Switzerland, not of GDP, but at least in human rights, women's rights, uh, the rule of law? These are things which are really monitored very closely by the European Union because uh, this status is not given to us forever. It's given to us after uh, evaluation and revision all the time. A country very old, very old. We have artifacts and even recently, a few months ago, we discovered uh, a hominid which was the skeleton was dated 300,000 years. So maybe the origin of the human being is not only in the Rift Valley, which uh, I, uh, we agree, all of us, uh, but also we are talking of our species, Homo sapiens sapiens. Maybe there was a route to the West and maybe to Central Africa also. So it's something which is being studied. I mean, there are many uh, laboratories interested in. This is to tell you that we are not, we are very good. It is not to say it with pride. It's just a fact. And But this has, has as a result, a building and building and building a state. We are a monarchy. We have always been a monarchy. So nothing surprising. We are not a republic, that's true. And we are a monarchy which has now a constitution, but it has it already. It's a new constitution. The constitution I'm talking about was approved in July 2011. It was drafted by a team of 19 persons, designated by the king, and we were very hard. I was a member of that team. And after two, two months, we had to deliver the goods. And then, of course, the king had to uh, also uh, have his opinion, consult with the political parties, with the social civil society. You cannot imagine the meetings and meetings and meetings to reach almost everybody. And, of course, the draft was approved, and we are really, it is our supreme law, no doubt. And the slogan of the country is, God, because we are a country of believers, I will explain which kind of believers. And number two, the Muslim, Allah, Allah, Al-Watan, Al Malik, and the King. But just behind it is the Constitution, because it is a constitutional monarchy. And the Supreme Law, of course, applies also to the King in one way or another because he is the protector. And this constitution is a bill of rights. It's not very long, but it has a preamble, which is crucial, crucial. And I will explain to you why. And we spend hours drafting it. <coughs> it states what we are, monarchy, constitution, belonging to the Arab world, following the United Nations resolutions, belonging also to or close to the European Union, close to Africa, of course, because we are also an African country. Our roots are in Africa, obviously. And there are religious reasons, there are cultural reasons, and there are economic reasons, of course. We have also our interests to defend. And this preamble says, for the first time in the history of the country, it was started with Hassan II to some extent, but his son, the present king, His Majesty Mohammed VI, wanted us to say in a way, very delicately, because every word was weighed that we are a pluricultural country. We are not a single cultural country. <coughs> because when the Islam arrived in the country in the 8th or 9th century after death, they found people. It was not Terra Nullius. There were people living there. And those people are called Amazir, Berber speaking. And until today, they speak five vernacular languages. 
and depending on where they are, the north, the south, etc. They were very often located in the mountains, the three mountains areas, and they had the traditions. They were not Islamic people, they were pagans, <laughs> and in a way the Islam converted them. It was not easy, it was difficult, because the people were reluctant. But also among those Berbers, maybe some people say in the first century there were Jewish people installed in the country, coming from the east, settling around the Mediterranean and landing in Morocco. And their roots are very old, very old, and we have the, the artifacts to show that. So Islam had to live. And today one of the key words we use in our societies is living together in harmony. Well, at least living together. It's already an achievement. But they were these people living practically together in the same space, the geographical space, suffering from the same epidemic, from the same uh, facts of life, difficulties, dry seasons, etc. We used to be the granary of Europe olive oil, cereals. Today, we are still a granary, but we still import half of our wheat because, because we, we have not enough land. Therefore, you see, this uh, pluricultural aspect, we had to find a way to express it. And one of us who is geographer said, why don't we speak about a river River and it has tributaries. And the bedrock of this river is, of course, the Arab Islamic civilization. It's the Berber speaking people, the Amazigh, and to the south, in Saharan provinces, we have the Hassan. Built on that, we this river is fed by various tributaries. And among them, I'm not going to cite all of them, Andalusian, uh, Phoenicians, uh, Romans, and Jewish. We say Hebraic, Hebraic. Because again, you had to weigh every word and say, ah, the parents, how the people would accept that. But it was the first time the country recognized that it was not a monolithic country. But we are a nation. We have no aborigines. We have cultures with their traditions, with their even language. Can you imagine people speaking their language for 2,000 years, even today, and understanding each other and protecting? The religion of the state is Islam. Yes, it is in the Constitution. But immediately afterwards, we say, we protect the three religions of the book. <laughs> they can have their sites. They can have their temples, they can have their cathedrals, and you can see that even today, of course. And therefore, immediately Islam behaves as, as the moderate Islam, as Islam who understands the other religions. We do not accept what is called evangelism, proselytism. We are careful about that. And therefore, recognition of that in the preamble of our constitution. And this preamble is not like many preambles of many constitutions, it's part of the constitution. It's part of it and it is really embedded into it. Therefore, everything derives from that. If you are a pluricultural country, you have to respect the culture, you have to respect the religions, etc. <coughs> And we have the fortune, I'm saying the fortune, to have a king. This king is not all of a sudden, it has behind him 17 centuries of old monarchs. He can even say to some extent that he is related also to the prophet, yes. But he is really the man who arbitrates. In other words, 
He has powers, but he has not all the powers. And I can tell you why. He is, above all, first of all, the commander of the believers. He is not the commander of the Muslims. He is the commander of the believers. That is to say, he, his role is, of course, to promote Islam, to promote the religion, to protect this religion, and to make it evolve, not to make evolve the holy scriptures. That's out of question. But to evolve in the interpretation of a number of things. In a way, let me say that, and dare to say that, he is our Pope. He decides. And after consulting, don't think that the, 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 uh, the king decides uh, immediately and from, tomorrow, from tonight to tomorrow, and I decide. No, it's not like that. It's consultation of councils, of faith, of man of faith, of, uh, of the tradition. He is weighing everything to see if this reform could pass or not. Because he is the protector of the Constitution. He is the one person to do this kind of thing. We have a parliament elected every four years with two chambers, a lower house. And this parliament is, for the first time, the origin of the law. It's not the king. Previously, the king made a decree, and that decree was a law. No, today, the law comes from the parliament, that is to say, from the representatives of the people of Morocco. It's an important change. And the king, of course, could see if the law, which has been adopted by the parliament, is constitutional. That's his role, to see if it and sometimes he can, we have a constitutional council, he can say, look, gentlemen, can you verify this and that? And he is the man who at the end decides. And this has been for many years, and many, many years. By the way, we have tried two or three other systems. There were coup d'etat, um, it didn't work. It didn't work because it's a complex fabrics of tradition, of way of life, of uh, cultural of rituals and so on, which have really made like uh, layer after layer after layer, after layer. And that makes the richness and the diversity of this country. So, the, my conclusion at this stage is to show to you and to uh, alert you to this complexity of the division of power uh, from the political viewpoint. I'm not I'm, I'm just saying this from the political viewpoint, how it works between the three powers, the executive, the uh, legislative, and uh, the judicial. And uh, we try to separate uh, the three of them. And while doing that, we have to be modern. What do we mean by being modern? Well, being living in our times, changing with the changes we are seeing around us and within us. Changes because there are rights. We are not going by the European standards necessarily or by the same speed as, but we have objectives. For example, if, t if I take the women's rights, it's obvious that women in Morocco have all the rights they deserve. We all agree on that. But in the Constitution, we say men and women are equal. That's the objective. That's the target. I think one day we'll achieve it. I'm, I'm sure. Because I see the struggle, the fight the women are doing, the women's association, the civic society. And this is for me is the hope. We have an enormous civic society. Maybe 5,000, 6,000 NGOs working in all fields. Of course they are good, they are bad. But this is a movement from the not top down, but down to the top. 
and it's encouraging because this is hope. We have changed, for example, the personal status because we are not ruled by the Sharia. We are ruled by a civic code, by a judicial, etc. Only our personal status, that is to say, the way we marry, the way we are born, etc. These are ruled according to each culture. The Jewish have their courts, <coughs> they have their rabbis, they have their way of ruling their divorces when the wedding is finished. <coughs> and they have their tradition. That is why sometimes, as Anders Sagan used to say, I have my Moroccan Judaism. That is to say, a Judaism appropriate and adapting for years and years to the Moroccan context. For example, when the judges took a decision, there was a jurisprudence. They, they were trying to find out was uh, in the past a, a similar judgment and how it was ruled. So they adapted. They were not changing again the Holy Scripture, the Torah, but they were adapting for the interpretation. The same approach Islam was doing. So we, we, we are so close. We are, of course, brothers, and we belong to the Semitic branch. That is why I say sometimes, when you say this is an anti-Semite people, it is not against Jews only, it could be against Muslims, because we belong to the same thing. And of course today it is mostly used, uh, uh, and you know how, it's, how things are going in Europe today, uh, and how it worked in the Second World War, I'm not going to talk about that, that it's the past, it's horrible past, and I'm not going to mention it. But, the, um, Coming back to Morocco, and to say, for example, how the king appointed a commission. He did, he did not decide. He appointed a commission of wise people who discussed for months about how to change the personal status. For example, the woman could be repudiated all of a sudden, and she's in the street. Today, now, it should be a divorce, it should be a judgment. There should be a pension, and if the, the man cannot give the pension, he's put in jail. Things have changed. But we, when we come to heritage, it's not the same. Man inherits her Why? Maybe from the human rights aspect, it's unjustified. It's not fair, because they are equal in the constitution. So there is a battle, and the, the, the struggle is difficult. But the king said many times, I am with you, but you can understand my position is not that easy. But we, I think, I'm sure we will achieve it. Tunisia has achieved it. It's our neighbor, it's our ally, it belongs to the same faith, and they struggle, but they, they are a republic. Their uh, head of state is not the guardian of Islam. And therefore, we see how changes could also induce in our own country the same kind of changes. We will. And recently, for example, there, was, there were um, tribes in some part of the country, uh, the land of which was expropriated by the state to build uh, a railway. The money the state gave, we gave it to the, to the men. So the women protested, protested strongly in the street, taking to the street, etc. Even the, of course, the attention of the king was drawn. But this movement called the Suleliyat, the women, finally won. And finally the money was divided. Because they say, we were also farmers. We were also livestock. Uh, why not us and all to the world? And as the state was responsible for having done this thing, this expropriation, well, the state has to abide by this rule of fairness. In terms of uh, another, and, and this, of course, is, is a sign of modernism, it's a sign that 
we are on tune with the society we live on. The another aspect, by by the way, or from the political viewpoint, is of course to respect the multi-party. We had we had in we in our country we have all kinds of parties. Maybe too much, something like sixty or seventy. Maybe three or four would be enough. But this is how it is. We have a press which is diverse. Of course, of course, I know that there are some taboo uh, uh, aspects we, you don't have to touch. You cannot criticize Islam. It's difficult. Because if you criticize Islam, is that you have uh, a kind of power which could be a religious power uh, uh, to criticize. We, it's difficult also to criticize the king personally, but indirectly you can say a number of things which could be uh, indirect criticism. So we have, I not say completely free, but we have a rather free press. The elections have been in the past more or less, uh, you can understand what I mean, that today I can assure you that the elections are 95% fair. This is progress. This is something which one day I hope it will be 100%. That we elect the right people we want and we elect people who are every day more educated. We have now a parliament which at least 60% of them have at least a master degree. So that's interesting. Because we are ruled by these people, so they have to know better than us to decide. Another sign of modernism is the openness of the country. We are an open country. We are open to the investments. We are open to all kinds of people coming to our country. They are more than welcome. We have today 11 million tourists. It's not enough. We can have twice. Ireland has 11 million. And uh, Ireland has 70,000 square kilometers. So, there are possibilities. But we have to recognize that we have uh, a fleet of planes, which is it's big already, but not enough. So, we need money, we need to expand. Boeing is there, Airbus is there, we have a hub in Casablanca, a maintenance of Boeing equipment. Therefore, I mean, this openness, we are not some um, country which is inward looking. We have Moroccans everywhere, we have five million diaspora, to use a word which we used at the beginning for Jews. But there is, I mean, uh, five million Moroccans abroad. You can go to Adelaide and you discover in a bar that there is a Moroccan Adelaide, the end of the world. <coughs> so, why? Of course, these people migrated because they wanted a better life, they wanted to find a family, etc. I understand. Or to go to study and remain. In a way, we miss them because they could be useful, but on the, uh, at the same time, it's not. We, we don't call them traitors. They, they decide that this is a human right, mobility, and so on. And we hope that most of them will come back, or most of them remain, because we need them. Therefore, you see, all what you, you saw in this video, which is done marvelously, uh, it's very well done, show to you that because of this openness we are at the same time a country which is targeted. We are not safe completely. In the sense, we are safe because we have a political stability, that's true, and we can prove it for ages. But we have chosen our camp. Our camp is against extremism. Our camp is for a tolerant Islam. 
Our camp is for to accept other cultures wholeheartedly and to respect them, to apply the rule of law. That people don't like that, some of them. And we had two or three uh, terror attacks. That's true, we cannot deny them, these are facts. But not so often, because we have also very good police services. No, no, we are among the best. And they collaborate with others, because these people are dangerous. And we have to protect ourselves and our security and the tourists of our country. From time to time, uh, things could happen very, uh, which cause a lot of sorrow and uh, we don't hide them. We try to see which are the deep causes, because the deep causes could be poverty, extreme poverty, could be uh, delinquency, could be drug, could be many things. And these are really the good soil on which, of course, terror would grow. And if we know these parts of the country, and we know where they are in Casablanca, etc., we have to bring their education, to bring schools. This is what, I mean, for example, uh, very talented painters are doing, creating a high school in the middle of nowhere. And, of course, the, the state does what he does, he has to do, but it's not always without all the means, a limited means. So we recognize, and that is why I told you it is a challenge, because we are faced with so many needs, uh, a wide range uh, of needs, and at the same time we have not all the resources we, we would like to have, but we have cooperation, we have friends in the, all the countries, in the Arab world of course, by definition, but we have also in the European Union, and and the United States and elsewhere. Because they respect and they, they care for this stability, for this openness, for uh, this... Uh, uh, which also is shown in the culture. We have so many, I mean, uh, diversified festivals, music, arts, paintings, all the year back. We have, of course, local, we have national and we have the international too. The Festival of the Sacred Music of Fez is now has a, quite a reputation all over the world. And every year at the same time, in the same city of Fez, the spiritual city of the country, the country which has the oldest, one of the oldest <coughs> universities in the world, which is also the city where the uh, saint of the Tijanids, uh, of Senegal is buried, and it is a pilgrimage. I mean, every Senegalese who comes to Morocco goes to Fez. Not because of Fez is an interesting city, but to worship his, of course, uh, saint. We have something in common, you know, between Jews, for example, and uh, Muslims. It's what we call the culture of the saint, of the holy man and people. So we pray sometimes the same, in the same site. The Jews and the Muslims go at different seasons. And this is something very peculiar to Morocco. You don't find it in, maybe in Tunisia, in the south of Tunisia, in the island of Jerba, which is one of the very oldest Jewish communities established in the Arab world. You may find these kind of things. So it is again a sign of tradition and modernism, to, uh, to induce, to praise, to make that these things happen more and more. To tell you the truth, we have almost one million Jews in Israel from Morocco. We are now at the fourth generation, I'm not talking about their ancestors. And every year, from Israel, 80,000 people come to Morocco to visit the sites of pilgrimage in Esawira, in uh, 
in the deep south, in the deep south, because we had Jewish communities in the deepest uh, south of the country, dispersed villages, living in the same place. You cannot distinguish a Jew from a Berber, from what he wore, from what he, he ate, etc., except, of course, the, uh, the religious uh, taboos, food taboos, or, or something else. So, uh, I wanted really to make you feel the delicacy, the difficulty, but also the achievements, the challenges, and the prospects behind us. Among these prospects, we have a serious problem with the youth. We have invested from independent from 1956 enormous amounts of money, enormous, in education. We are probably one of the countries which has spent an enormous amount, considerable amounts of money. But we have, of course, very good trained people, excellent. Because when you see, for example, this solar plant, who maintains this solar plant and all this? These are Moroccan engineers. They are not German engineers or Spanish. Mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we have still a school which is not up to our expectation. We are still, and the king has repeatedly and hammered this issue. We need, we need, because he can say, look how much money we invest. So I need results. And it's a very complex problem. It's a problem of language. It's a problem of trainers. It's a problem of salaries. How you attract the people. It's a mixture. And we are facing this. We try to change. And even now, that is to say, for the last few months, efforts have been made to improve our system, to deliver more and better, better quality. At the same time, we have around our public system many private schools. And those who have money send their children to the private schools. So there is a competition. I am from the public school. I am proud of the system who train me. But I would like that my school of today be at the same level as the private school. Or as a school we have so many of the cultural missions. French, British, American. Belgian, Turkish, you name them. And everyone, of course, has a curriculum which, of course, has its uh, international standards and, of course, their own language. So here we have uh, a real challenge. We are facing it. We Seriously, we are not, of course, uh, it's not a question to hide it because it's obvious. You don't have to hide it. And... Uh, at the university also, we have a problem of now, how are we going to change the people who retire? We have not planned, we have planned, but they are not attracted to this profession. So we have to see how in 10 years we are going to have the professors to teach to, their, to our students, you know. So we are thinking of various solutions, of, uh, Sometimes nitty-gritty, sometimes complicated, and sometimes I think useful, and they will give us some results, I hope. Another issue which is linked to our economy. You have seen that we are the first producer and exporter of phosphate in the world. You have seen this danger uh, motor car plant. It's absolutely a marvel and it is the largest in Africa. You have seen all this. We can say we are the third, we are the second, we are the third. Fair enough. Nevertheless, we have an economic growth rate of 3%. It's not enough. We would need 6%, 7% to give jobs to our youth. And we have so many young people. And we have an underemployment rate of something like 20%. Among graduate people, that is to say, people who have a degree in their pocket. Probably it's not the degree the, uh, the entrepreneurs want, but it's a degree. So we have to face this problem, and again, the king has repeatedly hammered the issue to the government. 
But it's an issue of the government, not of the king, to rule these kind of things. In other words, this is also a sign of modernism. We don't hide the problems. We take these are the problems and how we are going to face them. Respecting the international standards of quality, uh, uh, also doing our best to be more efficient in spending the money because the problem of efficiency also uh, is, in, is relevant to the, to the issue. So we have, to some extent, a thriving economy in some areas. Our first item of export is the motor cars. But the motor car today will be obsolete in 10 years. So how are we going to face this issue? Are we going to continue to produce motor cars like those? Nobody will, will buy them. Or maybe some other countries in Eastern Europe or maybe African countries. We have to make technological innovation. And we are negotiating with the big uh, motor car uh, builders which are in Morocco, like Renault, like Nissan, like Peugeot, and others. All the companies are there. All the equipment are there. But we have not yet reached the point to say to them, look, in our contract you have to give me your technology. That is what the Chinese are doing when they build uh, an airplane, uh, an aircraft industry. They say, you break, you, I will construct the plane in China, but you bring your technology. And therefore this is something we can request. Uh, and I think it's possible to negotiate that, for example, progressively in Tanger, we start building electric cars and exporting electric cars and progressively eliminate. Of course, some people will be out of jobs, but we will reincorporate them in a way. The car, the, 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 the factory you saw, will be probably robotized in five, six years. So there will be people laid off. But these people, we have to retrain them to be those who would maintain the robot, because the robots also have breakdowns. So, you see how the complexity, especially for a country who has no fossil fuels, no fossil energy. So we have to rely on wind, on sun, <coughs> on hydroelectricity, at least for electricity production. But for the rest, we have to import, of course, our oil and transport. But we will think of electric transportation. If we produce electricity, we can have trains. We can have public transportation, and we have made enormous progress in the city of Rabat, there is a tramway. In the city of Casablanca, there is a tramway. But it is already saturated, so we have to build another one, and another one. So this is to tell you that 3% in the best agricultural years, because we still depend too much on agriculture. It's, of course, our second item of export. It gives a lot of work, especially in the rural area, obviously. But when you depend too much on rain, on rainfall, etc., you have a bad year, you have, and we are really stricken by the climate change. We will be among the first countries to be hit strongly in the coming year. So we know that. The climate specialist told us and we saw it on the map. So we have to prepare ourselves. And to do what? Because countries which are now under forest will become subhumid. And those who are subhumid will become semi-arid. And those who are semi-arid will become desert. And we have already half of our territory which is a desert. So you can imagine the pressure on the rest of the land. So we face this problem. We have trained, we are training very good agronomists. We even send them to some extent during, uh, within the framework of the South-South cooperation. Because we, I repeat, we are an African country, we have our interests, but we, we would like, and this is the, the policy of the king, but of course the, of the whole countries, to cooperate with the African countries on an equal basis. 
I mean, to patronize and say, we know better than you. No, no. Of course, there are banks, there are uh, telecoms, uh, enterprises, etc., who are installed in Senegal, in Burkina Faso, in Ivory Coast, mainly on the Western, in Western Africa. But we deal with them on an equal basis. And we send, for example, agronomists to help the people to change the agriculture, to adapt it to climate change, to use fertilizer, to use drip irrigation, because we are using it and we have some experience uh, in it. To give you another example in agriculture, because I told you I forgot about my lecture. <laughs> to try to be as uh, clear as possible. Again, in, in agriculture. During the last century, at the end of the last century, before Hassan II died, he launched an enormous program of dam construction. We have built an, an enormous quantity of dams. At the beginning, with French people, with French engineers, and afterward, it was our engineers. And today, we are building our dams by ourselves. And we have a whole program of another series of dam building. And when Hassan II said, we will irrigate one million hectares, some people laugh. That how come? Never achieve. We have achieved. And we are irrigating one million hectares. But now we need not another million, but at least half of it. And we have a whole plan called Morocco Green, which tries to assist the small and uh, poor agriculture and at the same time the uh, uh, well-known exporting uh, farmers who even don't need the state because they know what to do. So to conclude, because I say more at the and uh, I would like to tell you, first of all, how glad I am, not standing, but sitting uh, before you, and uh, to try, I think you have grasped, grasped what I meant by uh, the difficulty, but also the challenging, and what we have achieved, and what we will achieve, and what, how we have failed, and, and we try to know our failures, the reasons, and how to improve it. And to be, at the same time, a country proud of his tradition, proud of his religion, proud of his culture, but at the same time trying to be as modern as possible, not necessarily by Western standards, but by our standards, which of course, some of them are universal, some of them apply to any country, and try, I say, to navigate in this uh, dangerous waters of today. Thank you very much for your attention. to listen to Professor Sassan, um, his candid evaluation of his country, his beautiful country, and I'm sure you learned a lot. Uh, it was a great, mind-opening lecture for me, especially as a person from Turkey. Uh, some of the challenges that Morocco faces are very uh, similar to the challenges that Turkey uh, has to deal with. So, uh, thank you very much. It was really uh, an amazing lecture. So, if you have some questions, I think we can get a few. Yes, please. Thank you very much. You're very interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, very small details. I think you used the phrase, keep it off the book. Yes. I did not expect. Well, what does it mean? Of course, it's uh, in the order. It's Judaism, it's Christianity, and it's Islam. It's your open book. That was the expression Hassan II used to to, to use, and he uh, wanted, for example, interreligious dialogue. And I remember having to explain to him on behalf of UNESCO what kind of meeting he wanted. And he said to me, please, Professor Sasson, because I dare to say to the king, please, sir, would you accept that we invite somebody from the Far East? What do you mean? I see a Buddhist or a Shintoist. He said, no. I don't know this uh, religion. I don't know these philosophies. 
I prefer to deal with things I know. And therefore we had a meeting between Christians, Jews and uh, Islamic. The best in the world uh, who came to Morocco to discuss in 1991. Uh, because he was very much in favor of uh, really this intercultural interface uh, dialogue. We are members of this alliance of civilizations. We are members of the Aladdin project. So we participate and we say very seriously and very sincerely. We are not just to, to be, to occupy a seat. No, we, we believe into it. And our, we believe in the United Nations. We believe in the Arab League decisions, etc. And we try uh, to play our role, not more than our role, our role. And I hope that we will be understood more and more and that our policy of tolerance, of uh, to better understanding, to be together. Uh, and we are preaching the same thing for our Moroccan diaspora. Uh, the people who live in France, who are from Moroccan origin, who are already French citizens, most of them. Like here, they are Irish. Okay? Well, they have to live, I mean, in good <coughs> harmony with the people. They have accepted them, they have received them. That's normal. And the king used to say, you are my ambassadors. That's true. But it's not so easy because you have the, the extremism which is creeping, you have those people who are of mindset and is different, who don't accept the foreigner. We know all that, you see, we have li lived that through. Now, I may make a remark with Turkey, in relation with Turkey. Turkey is ahead of us in the textile industry. And the reason is not design. We are good designers. We produce excellent uh, fabrics, but we don't produce cotton. They produce cotton. <laughs> in other words, they have the raw material, and having the raw material, they can have prices which beat us. Except, except for some captive markets we have in Europe, because now we, because of the crisis, we have to do uh, a very weak change in the model and to provide, to supply small quantities, not big quantities. Because nobody today is storing. Because, you know, uh, the last sales in Paris were a failure. People are not recuperating what they sold. So, this is just an example, but we cannot do we cannot produce cotton. We have not the climate. It's, it's out of the question. So we have to see how we could find the margin in the design, in the, uh, uh, the way we produce the textile fabric. It's very complicated to compete with a country like Turkey. Uh, we have trade agreements with Turkey. We have cooperation agreements with Turkey. But we have to recognize uh, that we cannot in some areas because uh, we can compete in olive oil. Yes, yes, we, we have the same variety, we, we have the same quality, and then of course we can compete because we have produced the raw material. But we don't produce the raw material, it's much more difficult. Excuse me to have made no, no, this no. parenthesis. <laughs> oh, for the we are good designers, no, not really. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. The story of Morocco simply what reflection, association, progressive developmental initiatives are being attached to neighboring and further African countries? Well, uh, I can respond to what you have said if I understood you correctly. Never in the history of Morocco a head of state has traveled to Africa as our king. Never. Why? And he privileged Africa versus other countries. Number one, to explain to many countries and to many partners that we 
are an African family because some people deny it. Say, why, why? We are not African. You are North Africa. But we are North Africa close to Mauritania. And furthermore, close to Senegal. Therefore, we have our right to say, yes, we are an African country. And the very fact that we return to the African Union, African Union shows that we left the, Union, the African Union for good reasons. But then after so many years, we change our mind and we say, it's better to defend our case inside than outside. And we did it. And it's good for Africa and for us. Now, we are in Ivory Coast. We are in Seneca. And we try to also be present in your country, in East Africa. It's not in Francophone, but we also are learning English. And our think people are trained into English. And we try to be also in Central Africa and even in South Africa. I'm so glad that our relations have improved. And we have now uh, an embassy which works full time for the good relations with Africa. Because remember, I mean, we were against apartheid. We broke our relations. And we were in favor of Nelson Mandela. We fought for it. And we were sincere. It was not, I mean, just a, a fashion. So we want to show that we are an African country. And we want to share with African countries what we know best. If I know dripple irrigation best, well, I will tell you how I use it, how I use the computer, because there is always improvement of that, of that technique or technology. How to use the right fertilizer with the kind of soil you have, how to use the mixture of fertilizer with the soil you have. So these are, and we receive, of course, students from Africa, many, many, many of them. I remember when we created the National Agronomic School, the Institute Hassan II for Agriculture. I remember from the outset the director decided to have 50 African students, then 100. And today we have even, even more. And in the field of religion, we have African uh, students which are taught Islamic law, etc., to be imams. But imams trained in the Moroccan way, with tolerance, with openness. We teach them English. We teach them some mathematics. They are not only in religion, because they have to live in an open world. And this institute, which has been created at the request of the king, you know, and functions with only Moroccan money, we don't receive any gift. I mean, is doing something which the countries want, not us. They are the ones who request us, and we try to do it. Okay. So, Number two, South-South cooperation, on an equal basis, on an equal basis. We learn from them, and we also try to give them what we know best. We also want to defend our interests. We have our interests, like you have yours. And, for example, trades, business, etc. We have companies, startups, which are private, which are entrepreneurs, they have the right to go wherever they want. The state doesn't help them. They go by themselves and they establish, for example, a telephone network. Now everybody uses, I mean, the, the portable. We are among the countries which are most interconnected. The fixed land fixed telephone doesn't exist anymore. Everybody has, even the poorest has something. But the idea was to go to a country like Senegal and to say, well, now the French company doesn't accept a subscription below so much amount of money. But we Moroccan will tell them we will pay by the day. That's something clever, you know. And the man who has very little money, he, he, he changed to our system and not to the French system. We compete. We may be wrong. But we are right most of the time. So it's quite a successful uh, <laughs> approach, I must say. And I, I pay my tribute to my uh, fellow countrymen who, who are doing well and good for them. Because they pay their taxes, of course, to the Moroccan uh, state. Uh, 
fourthly, I think we have to be members of this big continent and particularly trying to be partners in a regional uh, association. That is why we propose to be member of the Western African mm -hmm. Trade uh, Economic Organization. Equals. 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 It's not really easy because we have some countries who say, oh, if Morocco is, it's a dungeon because his product, etc. They are right, they defend also their, their, their... So we have to try to negotiate, and uh, as you know, as a diplomat, more than me, when you negotiate, it's give and take, of course. Uh, <laughs> because it's not negotiation, therefore. It's not <laughs> anything else that impose. It's not imposition. So it's delicate. And we know that even we had some calculations, if there was a vote, that the vote would not be completely favorable to Morocco. So we have still to negotiate and to deepen. But we have this in mind. So that's another reason, that we are close to certain parts of Africa, so we, we will uh, do our best to be close to them, but for the other ones in Africa. Another example, our network of embassies has never been so large. So large! I remember when 20 years back, or 25 years back. Who, who would think an embassy in Thailand of Morocco? No. What are we going to buy from Thailand and to sell to Thailand? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. But political presence was important, and is still important. To have an embassy in Ireland, maybe it was maybe irrelevant, because if we have an United Kingdom, the, the same ambassador could be appointed. No. It's, there is a reason. So the network of the embassies is practically in Africa complete. That we have in every country one embassy of Morocco. It costs a lot of money. A lot of money, believe me. Because this is the ministry who eats money but he doesn't deliver anything. You know? <laughs> we, know that. we know that. And of course, uh, that the democracy has its price. And the presence has its price. And we have to pay for what we need. And I am the first one to be happy to see so many embassies to come here, to see that we have a friend, very esteemed friend, here as an ambassador, because he may have been a scientist uh, leading a company, but he's ambassador. So I'm happy because we are colleagues yes. and friends. And uh, there are many like him, young men, women, a uh, new generation of ambassadors. We have seen the older generation disappearing, not necessarily dying, but uh, giving the lead to these young people, the millennials, as we call them, you know, and uh, they are doing a fantastic job. Not because he is in front of me, but <laughs> really with very little amount of money. The minimum they are doing fantastic. They go everywhere. They, they, uh, they focus. For example, we, I'm here because he wanted me to keep an eye on a new agreement of exchange of students and of staff members. Good, good for Morocco. Good for Ireland. And he considered that his task is only politics, but he is also a very technical task, and he implements it. And we help him to implement it. So. That's more or less the reasons why we have these ties and we develop this ties with Africa as a whole and with, of course, some African countries more closely because of various reasons that you can understand perfectly. Uh, with Kenya, your country, we have very good relations. You are considered as one of the leaders in this part of uh, Eastern Africa. And uh, you are doing very well in terms of uh, telecommunications, and you are an example. And we try to understand how you succeeded uh, it. And 
you are an exporter of some agricultural products, I mean flowers, uh, etc. And uh, we have to see why and uh, that we are not competing on the same markets. And fair enough. And uh, with Ethiopia, we have uh, also developed our uh, relations. It's a very important country, big country. And uh, I remember having visited Ethiopia two or three times in my life. And I consider that the, uh, this is the seat of the African unity, of course, Addis Ababa. And uh, therefore, we have to be there. We have to be present and play our role. And my hope is South Africa. Uh, not to hide the truth from you, because I think that's really having important relationship with this the continent by itself, you know, who is evolving also with difficulty, with problems. But I think we have to, to be there to understand what's going on. And uh, I'm very happy that the relations... I remember having London in, in Johannesburg a long time ago when we had an ambassador at that time. But then, of course, the relations changed. And uh, now we are uh, going back to normal. Uh, so I think I have given you most or more or less an, a proper answer to your queries. Yes? Dr. Emily KZM, the Nigerian ambassador yes. to Ireland. Me. Thank you, Professor, for your erudite uh, speech or uh, presentation. Of course, Nigeria and Morocco, I'm sure you know, we have a good bilateral relationship. Probably that is why I'm behind him. In front. You can move next to me, please. It's okay. So please, yeah, you can add that. I can add it. It's okay. I can add it behind you. Okay, thank you. However, oh, you see, he's a dancer. Yeah. There's something you mentioned yes. about the problem of youths yes. in Morocco. And in Nigeria, we have a teeming youth population. And from what you said, we equally have similar problem. Yes. Is it possible for you to expatiate more on that? And from your own personal point of view, what do you think will be the best way to help these African youths? Because I remember attending a lecture by a South African professor that was organized by our then South African ambassador, and he equally mentioned this issue of youths. Yes. Unemployment is not because of education, it's lack of unemployment. So what can African governments do, apart from educating their youths, yeah. to help these youths? Yeah. Thank you. And you are perfectly right in uh, underlining this important issue, and uh, which is a matter of concern. Uh, there is, first of all, uh, a kind of disbalance between what the economic fabrics is and what the problem of employment. In other words, the economic fabrics cannot absorb what is on the market. So therefore, the effort is on the industry. The only solution in what we saw in Europe is the industrialization. In other words, the country has to produce more value added to its products and to be more competitive. There is no other way. Unless you are an in an authoritarian, authoritarian state and you decide about everything and you, you know the, the drawbacks. So, second reason, there is a discrepancy between what we produce as from our universities, from our schools, and the demands of the industry. They say, we don't need these people. What do you need? Another kind of people. Sometimes they create their own institutes to 
produce absolutely the kind of technician they want, for example, in aeronautics. We have a small aeronautic industry, but it is thriving, but we don't build planes. I'm not telling you, uh, I'm telling you the truth. We are producing some components which can be used elsewhere in Europe. Therefore, our university has progressively, because slowly, to change its degrees, to have specialized degrees, for example, in engineering, in technicians. Most of those people who are underemployed could be employed if they are retrained, for example, as technicians. You have somebody who has a, a degree in letters, but no, no employment. So what does he do with his degree? Nothing. So if we take him back for one year to put him in another uh, area, retrain it for two years, and produce it for a company, for something. So in other words, uh, try to reduce this discrepancy between what our system produces, education, and what the, the industry wants. In agriculture, for example, we have almost no underemployment because the rural development of the country absorbs more or less. And now we have another request from the government and from the king to try to create a middle class in the rural areas. That is to say, to have what he calls agricultural development. I would call it rural development because you can have tourism, combined with agriculture, combined with fruit production. Those who cut, don't cultivate, for example, cereals anymore and replace them by fruit trees. They make money. And they need people to help them making money. And we have examples uh, in this case. The north of the country was to be a poor cereal growing area with people almost earning money. And progressively, the Spaniards come and created joint companies to produce what? Strawberries, blackberries, and raspberries. And now all this area is red. Everywhere you drink juice of this, and we export. We export. What do we do in the Saharan provinces producing cherry tomatoes? Those cherry tomatoes are sold in Europe after two days. Transportation. But we need technicians. We need technicians to pump the water, to demineralize the water, to remineralize it and to irrigate because it's on sand. Sand you can eliminate and grow in another part. You don't need to sterilize, etc. It's just under greenhouses to the air because there is wind. Okay. So these are the new, what we call the new jobs the new opportunities. In other words, we have to create more and more of this. We always will have a deficit. We know that. Because to change your education system needs time. Now, what is wrong in the education system? We are going to tell you frankly. What is wrong? First, the teachers. We don't have the capacity to attract the best of our students to teach salary is too low. Although it has been increased, for example, in our country, the teacher of primary school and the teacher of secondary school are absolutely the same salary. There is no difference. This is important because the number of years to train them is the same. Because we need to have first a good primary school, even a good preschool. And now we have made compulsory that to the most extent, to the largest extent possible, at three years, the uh, young pupil, girl, and men be, uh, and boys be in the in the preschool system. We need to have a very good primary school, but we have a very important burden. You don't have it, although you have also your uh, vernacular languages, local languages, but you have English as the communication language. We must teach our young pupils 
first Arabic. Second, Amazigh. Now, it is the official language of Morocco on equal basis. But we have to catch up. We don't have all the teachers. Third, French. From the second year of the primary school. So it's not a foreign language. It's practically a national language. And then English at the beginning of the secondary school. So you can imagine the burden on the education system to have all these kind of teachers, not to speak about the science, etc., and only in languages. So it's that you're, that the reason why I said enormous amount of money are poured into the system. Now, the efficiency is not what we would wish, and we must increase it. Now, the problem is when you have 100 students graduated, from the high school. They have their high school degrees in their pocket. But the baccalaureate, as we call it in French, okay, this is the high school degree. <coughs> Maybe 50 of them will go to schools of engineering. They will prepare for high schools of engineering abroad. They will be the best of our best students. They will pass the selection exams, because there is a selection, it is not in the public universities, because it's against the law, finally, to select. It is not written, but they select. So they skim off all the best of the best, so what remains for the rest, for the University of Science, of uh, Law, of Letters? I would say the worst of all students. They don't have the knowledge, the capacities. So, and most of them will try to go to education. But also there are, I mean, selection systems. So we have to have another kind of secondary school education of quality, quality-wise. If we have that progressively, we would heighten the level of our students and better the students and the better you see the that formation, that training, and we will suit progressively the system. It's a long process because you train a student for about 15 years you know, from the uh, primary school. So it's a very long battle and struggle. If we were a country which has, like yours, fossil energy, maybe it would have helped because we would not import our oil. And therefore, this money, we will put it in other places, but we don't have it. So the vision of the king and of the country was to see forward and to say, look, I don't have any way. Solar, wind, and hydroelectricity. So I have to, have to use them. But we should, not have, we should not have this reflection now. We have it 10 years or 20 years before. Because it needs time to build all these plants you have, you have seen. And we have many of them being built around the country. So these plants will need engineers. We need a certain type of engineers. So our university, our schools have to feed them with the right kind of profile, you know. So it's this combination, it's this articulation between the educated system and the economic system. How you bridge the thing. Sometimes we succeed because we have very good engineers trained in Morocco and elsewhere who work for the country. We have very good scientists, researchers, but we still we have also very good technicians, but not enough and not in the right place. You know. So we have this uh, backlog of people being uh, graduated, all, all of us cannot become imams. We cannot be all priests, you know? So we have to, to think of how, of how well you, we, we use them to become the right, uh, those who will help best their country. So there is a problem, I agree with you, of unemployment. There is a problem of use because very often it's the same people. They could be 20 years old, they could be 25, they could be even 30. And we have to, to tackle this problem. Because if we don't tackle it, what would happen? It's the social explosion.
because these people are not having work, what they will do? They will be in the streets. They will be robbing, they will be... But it's impossible. This issue is unbelievable. So we have to face it and try to do our best to... And that is why uh, the government has this responsibility. The king, of course, is very, very keen on this issue. The issue of the languages. i come back to it. I used to be taught the science in French. So I learned physics, I learned chemistry, biology in French at the high school level. And even at the primary a little, because there is a little science there. At the university, of course, there was no gap because I was taught in French the same discipline. We have decided a long time ago to have Arab as the language of teaching the science. It's possible, or impossible. We did it, but we are not so successful. In other words, probably there is also a problem of language. And it is before the parliament these days to decide. We have already given our, uh, the king even gave his view without forcing, but it's the parliament to decide. But we, as a council for higher education, which is an advisory body, we said, look, we have to, not to go back to the past, but at least to start a transition where these disciplines, because how could you train people in the secondary in Arabic, and then when we come to the higher education, it is in French. I mean, it's unbelievable. The real issue was, I was part of that, in, in, after the independence, when we decided in the Council of Higher Education, we said, what should we do? There were people who said, Arabize, that is to say, train the people in Arabic in all the disciplines, all the disciplines, humanities and science. And there were others, I was among them, who dared to say, perhaps we could continue and train the best teachers, Moroccan teachers, and progressively eliminate the French teachers, etc. That was the, our independence. And then, when we have a critical mass of good people, well-trained, then we say, that, could you switch to Arabic? It would be easier than have now the people trained in Arabic to make them switch to French or to English. That's the issue we have today. And this is a serious issue, because I know the people in the Ministry of Education who are really sweating and trying to find a solution because you have to have a transition period because I think the law will be, will be passed. I hope because it will be, in other words, it will be 20 years back. So it's impossible. The law will pass. And therefore, progressively, those matters will be taught in the English or the French language. And progressively, we will try to convince some teachers who are now teaching these matters in Arabic to switch after six months of training or one year of training. And in the schools of teaching, of training the teachers, we will train them already in English or French. And that will be one way to improve the situation because if you have the right Lead trained people, they will find jobs by themselves, you know, because they are good and they are good in all the uh, meanings of the word. They are good in language, they are good and they, they can cope with the problem, they can open the, their ears, etc. Some of my colleagues say, look, it is not a battle against Arabic. Of course not. We are member of the Arab countries. Arabic is the culture of Morocco. Islam is the religion. We don't deny it. But we say, look, when you look at internet, those who use it, I don't use it. <laughs> because I have missed this uh, revolution. <laughs> I am too old. This is for my son, my daughter, and my country. All right. So, we tell them, look, look at internet. The literature in science, we talk of science, eh? you see that much in English, you see that much in French, and you see this tiny part in Arabic. So the choice is obvious. 
This is not against Arabic. I do repeat it. Arabic should be taught by the best teachers possible. And the hours needed in the primary schools and secondary schools. But at the same time, there is no, there is no contradiction to have a very good language to open our minds outwards and to be trained according to what the society and the industry wants. Otherwise, we will, I've been trained always, I mean, people unemployed and unemployed. To what extent? So, it's a complex issue. I do agree with you, and Nigeria is a giant compared to us, and therefore, uh, I agree with you, but you are a federal state, uh, which is different from us. We have also regions, but we, you have a federal state. So, each state can have its system, and, uh, and you could, in a way, mitigate the problem being a federal state. We cannot. And therefore, uh, that is why we are preaching for some local adaptation. Because not everybody should do exactly the same thing at the same time. This region could do that. This region could do that one year later. And therefore, <coughs> in education, like in health, we should adapt to the local situation. So it's, uh, it's more than a wish. It's, uh, it's really, uh, we are struggling with it. Definitely, and I'm sure, I hope, with those who would succeed me to win the battle. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Sasson. I'm sure you feel very privileged, as I do, to listen to Professor Sasson today to talk about his beautiful country. Um, and please join me too. Thank you. So the kind of reception upstairs, kind of provided by the Moroccan Embassy. Uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you very much.